Well, come on, everybody. Don't get quiet now. You sowed your seed. We took a quick second. Some of you might recognize the coat that I'm wearing because it's Pastor Chris's coat. I was going to switch it out for mine, but you know what the Lord told me? We are one. And he said, keep your coat on. And I said, I'm going to preach in this coat because I believe this. I really believe if you'll just take this next little bit of time, I know that God gave me a word. And I said, Pastor Chris preached half of it last night already. But I believe that there's something that's called a divine echo. My friend Margaret Feinberg, she's an author, a speaker, a powerful woman of God. And she, she told me once I was at a conference where every speaker kind of echoed what the other one was. And she said, I love it when the Holy Spirit brings a divine echo. Because there's something that you all need to hear tonight. Amen. So are you ready? You know, I want to tell you a quick little story. One of the things, you know, I like this coat. Pastor Chris bought it. I was the only one who liked it. Pastor Chris is the only person I know who can walk into a high-end store and he goes, yeah, I don't care about all this. Give me what you got in the back. And they always go, what? The last time we went to the store, the girl goes, sir, there's been nothing new since the last time you came in. Everything is out. But this coat was in the back and he got it and I liked it. No one else liked it. He liked it anyway. I still like it. I said, I'm going to wear that for conference. He said, no, you're not. I am. And I said, well, I guess look who's wearing it now, right? <laughs> but you know, like one day, I, I, here's the thing. God showed me something. I, I was at Marshall's one day. I, I had run into Marshall's just for a quick second. We love to go shopping, you know? So, I mean, if you have to go do anything, I go to Marshall's. If I need to buy a pin, I'm just going to drive out of my way and go to Marshall's. Why? Because there's going to be something that I'm going to like that I'm going to find. And I was at Marshall's and as I was walking through, I walked to the back of the store. I walked back up to the front of the store and I saw something that caught my eye. Do you ever see something that doesn't look like it belongs where you're at? And I walked past this rack that it was just set up just like this. And it had these jeans lined up like this. And I said, there's a, a logo that doesn't look like it belongs in this store. And I stopped in my tracks and I went back a little bit and I pulled the little jeans off the shelf and I looked and I said, this is not a brand that you would normally find in Marshalls. This brand is Roberto Cavalli, which if you don't know what that is, it's okay. But Roberto Cavalli is a very, very high-end designer. And I said, wait a second, these are Roberto Cavalli jeans. These jeans sell for about $500. Now, I wouldn't pay $500 for them, but if you go buy them in the store, these jeans sell for $500. They don't look like anything special, right? They just look like jeans, but they say Roberto Cavalli, have the little logo on the back, and they sell for about $500. They're not the Just Cavalli, which is a lower end that sells for about $300. They're not, he has two other lines, but these are the top of the line Roberto Cavalli jeans. And I looked and I could not believe my eyes because what I saw was a price tag of $15. And there was about six pair and I bought all six of them because I was going to sell them on Poshmark. That was two years ago. You can see they're still in my closet because I still, I gave a couple pairs away because we believe in sewing, not selling. Amen. Amen. Because I'll go sell those on Poshmark, make some money and buy some new jeans. But you want to know what? I looked at those jeans and I thought, wow, nobody knew in that store knew the value of the jeans. The girl at the counter, she said, oh, well, these are a lot of jeans. I said, well, sweetie, those are Roberto Cavalli jeans and they're on sale for $15 and you're not going to find them. And she said, oh, you know, I found these pair of leggings in here the other day and they were like, and I was like, no, sweetie, your leggings do not, it's okay. But not to sound pretentious, but I was like, those are $500 jeans that have a price tag on them for $15. But the Lord brought that back to my remembrance because just the other day I had gone in the store and I had gone into Marshall's again. I think it was TJ Maxx and I found a dress that had a label that I recognized, another high-end designer, and and the dress was selling for $29. And I said, that's a $300 dress. Who in the world is in charge of the inventory in these stores because they clearly do not know what they have? I know what they have, so I bought everything with that name on it. <laughs> found them in the clearance rack for $10. Found them, bought them. But you want to know what? The Lord spoke to me this week, and he said to me, how many of us are worth far more than the price tag that's been placed on us? How many of you are worth so much more than the discount tag that's been placed on you by things in your life? And through that story, there were four lessons. Actually, I thought I was going to go somewhere different, but God messed me up today because he took me somewhere else. And and I had something all laid out and God was like, I couldn't quite get it. And I was sitting down and God gave me four lessons that we're going to learn from my Roberto Cavalli jeans. All right. Is that okay with you tonight? The first lesson that I want you to learn tonight is that you are valuable. 
You need to know that you are valuable. Just say it right now. Say, I am valuable. I am valuable. See, you were created by the most exquisite designer that ever was. He was a designer that was more meticulous than the greatest fashion advisor or designer that there ever was because Jeremiah 1.9 in the New Living Translation says this, I knew you before I formed you in my, your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. You want to know what? He formed you. You know how it says in Psalm 139 that I formed you in your mother's womb. I knit you together, your most innermost parts. He said that he fashioned you. Not only did he fashion you, but in Genesis 1:28, he fashioned you. He said, let us make man in our image. And he created you in his image. And then not only that, in Genesis 2, 7, he breathed the breath of life into you where you became a living spirit. Then he put a price tag that, on you that was priceless because it was, the birth, it was the death of his only begotten son. You are valuable. And we walk around and things happen in life and situations occur and people do us wrong and things happen and pretty soon we don't look like we're valuable and we accept that we're $15 when we're worth far more than that. And I see people and I sat at my desk today and I had tears in my eyes as the Holy Spirit was speaking to me today because I said there are people in this room, there are people who are watching this online tonight, there are people in this room that you have believed the lie of the enemy for far too long, that you are not valuable, that you have no worth, that you don't have a purpose, that you're done. I was called then, but I'm not called now because of everything that happened and I'm here to tell you tonight that you're valuable. And I have one goal tonight to make you believe with everything that you have that you are valuable. Amen. That you are valuable. That you are valuable. The second thing I want to tell you is that your value is not based upon someone else's inability to recognize it. You want me to say that again? Your value is not based upon someone else's inability to recognize it. See, those genes were very expensive jeans. Why are they expensive? Because of the designer who made them. They, I have another pair of jeans in my closet that look just like that, that cost $29.99, for real. But you wanna know what? Those jeans, because of the designer, because of the label, because of his reputation, because of what he has curated, there is a value that is on the items that he creates that although someone else didn't recognize that they were valuable, that did not diminish how much those jeans had value. And just because someone had the inability to recognize the value that's on the inside of you, that doesn't lessen the value that you have. Amen. But so often what we do is people don't value us and pretty soon we start to begin the lie that we aren't worth it, that we aren't valuable. Well, I guess that's why they left me. I guess that's why I didn't get the promotion. I guess that's why this happened because someone else's inability to recognize the value that in you made you stop believing that you were valuable yourself. See, not only did the inventory director at Marshall's, whoever, they should be fired. I'd fire them if I was there. Not only did they not recognize the, the value of the label, because you want to know what the original price on those were? $39.99. $545 at the Roberto Cavalli website, and someone marked them $39.99. Not only did they not understand or recognize or see the value that was in them, neither did anyone else who walked through that store for probably about two months. Because you know it takes them some time to even mark them on clearance. And not only were they marked in the red tag clearance, but if you go to Marshall's and TJ Maxx, you know that a couple times a year they do the yellow tag clearance. That's the final clearance, the bottom of the barrel before they leave the store. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in here today? Am I the only person that shops at Marshall's? Okay, listen, those were not only marked down on clearance, but nobody recognized the value of what they were. And so they were marked down to the yellow tag clearance, the final clearance before they get shipped off somewhere. And they were marked $15. Y'all look at me like, what? are you guys hearing me tonight? 
Because how many of you, somebody not only didn't recognize your value to begin with, but they marked you down a couple times and you started to believe that that's all you were worth. But see, I walked into that store. I walked past a little glimpse in my eye. I saw the back pocket and I said, whoa, hold on a second. Those are some jeans that I know right there. I know what those are. Oh, wow. Oh, wait a second. Here's another pair. Here's another pair. Here's another pair. And I went through all the racks until I found, actually, there was seven pair, two dark pair, and there were five light blue pair and I got them all and took them with me because you want to know what the $85 I spent was well worth it but nobody else I think in this town recognized what they were but you want to know what nobody recognizes who you are either but that doesn't diminish the value that you have I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7 and we're going to go and read a story that's very familiar to probably most of you. Luke chapter 7, we're going to look at verse 36. I'm going to read it to you in the Passion Translation. It said, Afterwards, Simeon, a Jewish religious leader, asked Jesus to his home for dinner. And Jesus accepted the invitation. When he went to Simeon's home, he took his place at the table. In the neighborhood... There was an immoral woman of the streets known to all to be a prostitute. When she heard that Jesus was at Simeon's house, she took an exquisite flask made from alabaster, filled it with the most expensive perfume, went right into the home of the Jewish religious leader, and in front of all the guests, she knelt at the feet of Jesus. Broken and weeping, she covered his feet with the tears that fell from his, her face. She kept crying and drying his feet with her long hair. Over and over, she kissed Jesus' feet. Then as an act of worship, she opened her flask and anointed his feet with her costly perfume. When Simeon saw what was happening, he thought this man cannot be a true prophet. If he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of sinful woman is touching him. And Jesus said, Simeon, I have a word for you. Go ahead, teacher, I want to hear it, he answered. It's a story about two men who were deeply in debt. One owed the bank $100,000 and the the other one only owed $10,000. And when it was obvious that neither of them would be able to repay their debts, the kind banker graciously wrote off the debts and forgave them all that they owed. Tell me, Simeon, which of the two debtors would be more thankful? Which one would love the banker most? And Simeon said, I suppose it would be the one with the greater debt forgiven. And you're right, Jesus agreed. Then he spoke to Simeon about that woman, that immoral, sinful prostitute, that wicked woman who was kneeling at his feet. He said, do you see this woman kneeling here? She is doing for me what you didn't even bother to do. She, when I entered your home as a guest, you didn't think about offering me water to wash my feet and wash the dust off my feet, yet she came into your home and washed my feet with her many tears and then dried my feet with her hair. You didn't even welcome me into your home with the customary kiss of greeting, but the moment I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't take the time to anoint my head with fragrant oil, but she anointed my head and my feet with the finest perfume. She's been forgiven of all her many sins. This is why she has shown me such extravagant love. But those who assume they have very little to be forgiven will love me very little. Then Jesus said to the woman, all your sins are forgiven. And the guest said, who can forgive sins? And Jesus said this in verse 50, your faith in me has given you life. Now you may leave and walk in the ways of peace. And when I read that story, I thought, man, that w- those people at that dinner that night had the inability to recognize the value of that woman. See, she had a label placed upon her by the religious leaders of the day. Her price tag was worthless. Her label was immoral. Her label was broken. Her label was sinful, but that is not what Jesus saw. When Jesus looked at that woman, he said, I see you, you're priceless. I see you, you're precious. I see you, you're an extravagant worshiper. I see you, you are forgiven. See, the thing is this, that your label was placed on you by God. That means that no one, not even yourself, can devalue the value of what he has given you and who he has made you to be. The third thing I want to tell you tonight is that your value is not placed, is not based upon the discounted label that others placed upon you. Your value is not based upon the discounted label that others placed on you. Do I have anyone in this place that you've been discounted? 
that people have looked at you and they've discounted you all the way down to the yellow tag final clearance. They've looked at you and they haven't seen the beautiful, wonderful, called, anointed person that you are. They look at you and they see what they want to see. Pastor Chris said it last night. He said some people just want to remind you of who you used to be because they can never get past the price tag that they put on you. But your value and who you are and the value that God has placed in you is not based upon the discounted label that someone else placed on you. See, just because that price tag says $15, that does not change the value of what those jeans Amen. are worth. That's right. That's right. It just doesn't. Amen. And just because people tried to discount you, it doesn't change the value on the inside of you. I want to tell you another story. Is it all right if we tell another story? We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and the New Living Translation. I'm going to paraphrase some. I'm going to read some because this is a great story. Pastor Chris talked a little bit about it last night too. But I'm going to talk to you about the story of David. David, a little shepherd boy. And basically, in verses 1 through 11 of Samuel chapter 17, Goliath the Philistine was openly taunting the Israelite army. They were out there. They were in the field. They were, they were fighting the Israel, the Philistines. It was like a standoff. You had the Philistines. You had the Israelites. And nobody, they were just going back and forth. You know what's interesting to me is nobody fought anybody for about 40 days. All they did was listen to somebody's mouth. Some of you need to stop listening to someone's mouth and pick up a sword and start fighting. But that's just something a little different. I'll give you that for free. Because here's the thing. They stood there and listened to a giant Philistine mock them and taunt them and taunt their God. These are the greatest and the strongest. David was just a little boy. He had a, if you remember when he got anointed king, he had all these brothers that were bigger and stronger and better. I have to believe that the army was made up of bigger, stronger, better guys just like his brothers. And they were out there and they were all terrified because Goliath was mocking them. He was taunting them. He was saying, come and fight me. And everyone was just shaking in their boots, standing there for 40 days and 40 nights, standing there. Jesse, who was David's father, he said, come here. David was a little shepherd boy. He hung out with the sheep, but he really wanted to be out there at the battle. I imagine he would go out there day after day. Many of you know the story. He started practicing with his slingshot. And he started killing the things that were coming for his sheep. And he probably wanted to be a warrior, but nobody saw him as a warrior. They saw him as a boy. And his dad said, hey, David, come here. I want you to go down to battle. And David was probably like, yes, this is my opportunity. Somebody give me a chance. Let me go to the battle. Let me fight. And he said, here, take lunch to your brothers because they're probably hungry. And he loaded him up with the loaves of bread and the food. And he said, go out to the battle. And when David got to the battle, in verse 20 through 23, Goliath started his tormenting like he did every single day. It had been 40 days and 40 nights, and they were still standing there. Everybody looking at each other, wondering, well, who's going to fight this guy? I mean, I kind of feel like all of them together probably could have fought that one guy, but I mean, that's just me. But I want you to read, we're going to read verse 24 right now. It says, as soon as the Israelites' army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He'll give that man one of his daughters for a wife. The man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. And David asked the soldiers, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. David came and this little boy is the only one standing up going, guys, what's going on here? What do you get if you kill the guy? What do you get? Pastor Chris likes to say, David didn't do it. He, David did it for the girl, the girl, uh, the girl, the gold and the glory. Because that's what he got, right? He goes to the battle. He sees the Philistine. He's mocking God. He's saying, hey, and he goes, what do you get if you kill that guy? Can you imagine these big, strong soldiers looking at this little guy going, what do you mean? What do you get if you kill the guy? Yeah, patting him on the head. But it says in verse 28 that when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. And he said, what are you doing here anyway? What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. See, David's brother immediately began to discount him. Who are you? You're a little boy. 
Why aren't you good? Not even watching a lot of sheep. Aren't you supposed to be watching the three sheep? Because that's all you're good for. I know you're prideful. I know you're deceitful. Go back to the field where you belong. The minute that David showed up, his brother said, no, that's not who you are. You go back and be a shepherd boy because that's who you are. He began to discount him. And then we know in verse 29, King Saul, somebody said, hey, this kid's asking about what somebody gets if they kill him. And Saul said, well, bring the little kid to me. Let me see him. And in verse 32, David said, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. And Saul said this, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. How many times have you stood before someone and said, we can do this, and had them tell you, nah, what are you talking about? That's impossible. That could never happen. You're just a little boy. You're just one person. You just, some of you have had dreams in your heart that have been crushed by the words of people who immediately discounted them. That's why what Pastor Chris said last night about being careful who you tell your dreams to. Because Saul said, no, that's impossible. You can't do it. So now his brother doesn't believe in him. The king, the ruler, the leader doesn't believe in him. He's discounted him and said, you're just a kid. You're just a little boy. He's going to crush you. You can't win this fight. You're definitely not. You can't even fight him. But David, after a minute, he said, fine, you know what? If you're this adamant, go ahead, go fight the giant. Go fight him. Let's see what you can do. And as we know, he tried to put his armor on him. And David said, no, take that off. I got, I got my, my little five smooth stones and I got my slingshot and I'm just gonna go do the things I know to do. And in verse 41 and 44, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Not only is his brother discounting who he is, not only is his leader Discounting who he is, now his enemy is openly mocking him, discounting who he is. He said, am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed him by the names of the gods. Then he said, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Goliath discounted David. He dismissed him as a mere boy. He insulted him. He threatened him. But this is really interesting because David was a man after God's own heart, as you know. And David didn't let the fact that his brother discounted him phase him. David didn't let the king phase him. And David sure didn't let the fact that this great enemy who was way bigger than him discount him, deter him from his course. Because in verse 45, he said this, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and I will cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know there is a God in Israel and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with the sword and not with the spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. See, David said, I don't really care what you have to say about me. I know that the price tag you tried to put on me was $15, but I know my value and my worth. I know that you try to tell me who I am, but I know who I am. And I know I serve a God who helped me to slow the lion and the bear. And he's surely going to help me kill you. Not only am I going to kill you with my five stones, but somehow I'm going to figure out a way to cut your head off. Remember that he didn't even have a sword. That's right. But he said, I know that my God is with me and I know that I'm going to kill you right now. David said, I don't care what discount you place on my life. I know that I am called. I know that I'm anointed. I know that I'm a warrior. I know that I'm a giant killer. I know that I have on the inside of me and I don't care what you try to discount me to. You'll never diminish the value of who God created me to be. And some of you need to learn a lesson from that little boy. Because what he did then, as David moved closer, we know that he ran out to meet him. He got his bag. He hurled it with the sling. He hit him in the forehead. He fell face down and he went and got him and he didn't have a sword, but then he ran over and grabbed Goliath's sword and cut his head off. See, the thing is, once you recognize the value that you place, you'll kill the enemy, but then you'll use his weapons against him. 
Those people that tried to come against you, you'll just turn it around and use them against him. The people that fought against you, you'll turn them around and then you'll fight against him together. See, some of you are too busy worried about the giants and worried about the friends. I need you to understand that his own family discounted him. His own family told him, you're not valuable. You're a little kid. You're a little boy. Stay out of this fight. And he said, no, I will not because my God is well able to overcome. And some of you say, you wanna know what? He doesn't just use your enemies, guys. He uses your family. He uses your boss. Some of you are at work and you go, my boss has sit there and tells me, I I don't know, I I try everything I can and my boss doesn't like me. How many of you have ever been in a situation where your boss just didn't like you? And no matter what you did, not Miss Melanie, I love you. That's my Miss Melanie. She's my sweetheart. No, but you've been in a situation where your boss doesn't like you and no matter what you do, when you try to work hard and you say, I know I'm a good worker and I know I do my job and I know I do my job better than anyone in this company, but the, the devil will use your leaders. He'll use your friends. He'll use your family and he will definitely use your enemy to try to discount you, to make you believe that you are less than what God created you to be. But you cannot My question is, who has, and not only this, because as soon as David killed Goliath, not only did he kill the giant, but the entire army that had been at a standoff for 40 days turned around and ran because a little boy had the courage to say, this is who God made me to be, and I'm not backing up no matter what you say. That little boy in one moment with one stone, one stone, got a whole army to leave. Can you imagine this picture? We've seen pictures of war, right, going on. Can you imagine Russia and Ukraine in a standoff and one little boy stands up and throws a rock and the whole other army turns around and runs the other direction? We read the story and think it's real cute, but we need to read the story and realize, my God, the same power that's in David, that value that was in him is in me. We need to read that story and recognize this is not a story. This is something I can apply to my life because I have a giant killer on the inside of me. There's a warrior on the inside of me. There's someone on the inside of me that God has made me and nothing you say or do, you're not believing in me doesn't make me not believe in myself. Who tried to tell you you're less than what God created you to be. And God showed me this. The fourth thing he showed me was that your value doesn't depreciate. Write that down. Your value doesn't depreciate. Everything else in life depreciates. You buy a car. What does Dave Ramsey say? Don't buy a new car because the moment you drive it off the lot, what happens? Thank you. And you drive it for a month and what happens? Well, not now. Now cars are hot. I mean, if you got a car, I told PC, I said, maybe I better go trade my car and I think I can sell it. It's my reaping season. Amen. Amen. (laughs) But you drive a car, it depreciates. You buy a house, what happens? It depreciates. Things happen, right? It depreciates. You have a house fire, what happens? The value of your house depreciates. Everything in life depreciates, but your value does not depreciate. And some of us walk around feeling like, oh, I've been doing this a really long time. I was called, I was anointed. I remember when I had the fire of God on the inside of me. I was called to sing, I was called to worship, but something happened and along the way, I started devaluing myself. And I just figured, you know what? It just was for another season and another time. Somebody asked me something the other day about something that I used to do. And I said, my season for that is over. It's not my season anymore. And I really do believe that because I feel like God showed me that I'm supposed to be doing something different. But you wanna know what? How often do we depreciate our own value for things that happen that are beyond our control, for things that happen in our lives? It can be easy to walk through life and because your circumstances aren't what you want them to be, you feel as though your value is depreciating. You fail at something and your value depreciates in your own eyes. Your marriage didn't work. And you say, you want to know what? My value must be depreciating. You aren't as successful as you thought you should be. You depreciate your value. You file for bankruptcy. And you say, I'm a failure. And you depreciate your value. But I want to tell you something, and you might want to write this down. I'm going to give you... Just because your situation deteriorated doesn't mean your value depreciated. I'll say that one more time for you. Just because your situation deteriorated 
does not mean that your value depreciated. Because things may depreciate, but you want to know what God showed me? You know what doesn't depreciate? A masterpiece. You have pieces of art in museums that are hundreds of years old, thousands of years old, and those things don't depreciate over time. They get increased value. Some of them are old and gritty and faded and worn and torn, and they've had the ages of time come upon them, and guess what? They're worth more now today than they were worth in the beginning. There are paintings that when the, when the painter, whatever they're called, the artist painted them, they weren't worth anything, but upon their death, hundreds of years later, they go for millions of dollars. And the Lord showed me that this afternoon, that a masterpiece does not deteriorate, and that is very good, doesn't depreciate, because here's the thing. The more difficulty that the item goes through to be still there, the greater value that it holds. And some of you need to recognize that you are a masterpiece. Maybe you've been through some stuff. Maybe people have tried to devalue you. Maybe you're a little worn around the edges. Maybe you're a little tired, dusty, rusty, worn out. But guess what? Your value has skyrocketed because of what you have been through. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 in the New Living Translation. I love this verse. I use it in a ton of messages because it's so powerful and you need to hear it every single day. Some of you should open this up and put it in your phone and make it be the first thing. Set an alarm at 6 a.m. that goes off and this is what shows up. You are, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You might feel a little dusty, a little worn down, a little worn out, a little torn, a little tattered, but that does not mean that you are deteriorated or depreciated. That just means that now I'm worth a little more. Why? Because I'm still standing here today. See, some of you kind of gave up a little bit on your dream and your purpose. Why? Because people used you, people abused you, people let you go, and you depreciated yourself based upon that. But you want to know what? I need you to rise up in this place and say, you want to know what? No, this just makes me more valuable because I took the test and I passed the test and I walked through things that other people couldn't have walked through. See your marriage that you thought, oh my God, it's over. And I don't know if we can do this when you came back together and allowed God to mend it and fix it. It's worth more than it ever was. See, when you get down and you say, you know what? I I have to start my career from the bottom and I got to start over. And you begin to rebuild and you begin to regain and God begins to restore. You look back and go, I've gained a wisdom and a knowledge and an understanding that I never had before. When you pastor a church. And you see that what you used to once have, maybe it dwindled down. And you go, man, I don't know. Are we doing something wrong? No, you're doing something right. Because God said you can be trusted. You're even more valuable now because you walked through fire and you're standing here today. And I read this verse today, and this is the verse that I read, where tears begin to fill my eyes, and I need you to listen because there's people in this room that I believe this will set you free. Isaiah 41, verse 43, 43, verse 1 through 4 in the New Living Translation says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you, O Israel, the one who formed you, who says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be there. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you go through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia, Hebrew, Cush, and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you're precious to me. You are honored and I love you. And I'm going to read it again in the Message Bible because it was too good not to. It says, but now God... God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the one who got you started, Israel. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have called your name. You are mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it will not be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. And listen to this part. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much 
I love you in this verse brings me to tears. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. I would trade the creation that I made just for you. Some of you need to know right now that no matter what you've walked through, you've walked through the fire, you've walked through the water, you felt like you were going to drown. The oppression of everything in life that you were going through, you'd wake up in the morning and you felt like there was claws around your neck choking the life out of you. And he said, you want to know what? No, don't be afraid. I'm with you. And you want to know what? I'm standing here with you and I love you and I'm proud of you and I've got you and I love you so much I would trade everything I made just for you some of you need to hear that today he's ministering to your hearts because there's some of you that have not believed that about yourself you have not believed that you're that valuable he said I would trade all of my creation he made everything in this creation and he said just for you I would give everything I had just for you. I will give everything I had just for you. I would trade everything I made just for one moment with you. I would trade it all just for a moment with you because I love you that much. Please tell me you are not valuable. Please tell me you are not worth it. Please tell me now that the God of the universe who would trade every star in the sky that he made for you, please tell me that you're not worth it. Please tell me that you have no value. Please try to tell me that after you read that. You can't, you can't because he loves you. You came to this place to go to the next level. We call it elevate because we're going to go to the next level, right? We say you don't want to leave this place the same way you came in this place. And if you don't value yourself right, you will never elevate to the place he called you to be. I need you to understand that. That's the only part of my message I had before today. Beside the story about my jeans, thank you. Beside the story about my jeans, that's the only part of the message I had, that God said, if you do not learn the value of who you are, you will never elevate to the place I've called you to be. Let me say it again. Until you value who you are, you will never elevate to the place that God has called you to be. Why is this so important? Because the world needs you. There's someone who needs you. There's someone who needs you to rise up and be the person that God created to be. No more shrinking back. No more deteriorating your value. No more saying, I'll let someone else do that because it's not my turn right now. It's not me. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not powerful enough. I I know they discounted me. See, I went and told them I'm a giant killer and they told me I was a little boy. I went and told them that I was going to shake the gates of hell. And they said, you're just a woman. Go sit down. You said, my family is going to serve God together. And they said, hi, your kids are a mess and so is your marriage. But you want to know what? I'm here to tell you today that when you begin to value who God called you to be, you will walk fully in the calling of who he is. Don't discount it. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you really quick four things that you need to elevate. Four places you need to elevate in your life. Okay, you ready? And because I am a huge fan of alliteration, they all begin with the letter A, because that's just what I like to do. So I'm going to be a little fancy with some of the words. I'll break them down, though, okay? Because I was like, oh, no, I can't have three A words in a word that begins with T, because that doesn't match. (laughs) I'm just funny. I'm weird like that. The first thing you want to do is elevate your awareness. Elevate your awareness. Pastor Chris is always fussing at me. Because he says, I do not pay attention when I'm out and about places. He's like, you're, you're not aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of your surroundings. He's always telling me to be aware of my surroundings. I'm like, I am aware of my surroundings. I was 30 years old when I married you. I'm pretty sure I did good up to then. <laughs> but you want, I mean, really. Sometimes he's like, oh, do you need me to back the car out? I'm like, sweetie, what do you think I did for 30 years? I love it. My husband is amazing. Let me just give him a kiss right now. My husband's awesome. I love him so much. He takes such good care of me, and I love it. Because you want to know what? I remember when I had to pump my own gas, and I had to go to work and work two jobs and work till two in the morning and come home and get up at eight in the morning to go back to work with my baby girl. And I'm so grateful that God brought me a man who wants to take care of me. So I don't mind that he fusses me, but you know what he says? Be aware of your surroundings. Which just means what you see. you got to elevate your sight. What do you see when you look at yourself? What do you see when you look in the mirror? What do you see when you look? 1 Peter 2, verse 9 in the Passion Translation says this, but you are God's chosen treasure. You're a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted one. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. 
He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. And from that one verse, I found about six things that you can take away that you are. You don't have to write them down because you can just get the verse. You are chosen. You are a treasure. You are set apart. You've been called out of darkness. You've been claimed by God. You are worthy. Get this. He claimed you worthy. He said you're worthy to talk about me. You're worthy to broadcast my wonders to the nation. You know, people don't have people that aren't worthy represent them. Right? You don't have to, if I'm going to have a representative for the ministry and somebody who's going to speak on my behalf, I'm going to make sure they can speak really well and say what I want them to say. God said, I count you worthy to broadcast to the world my wonders. And that's just not for the preachers in the room. That's for everyone in this room. That's for the businesswoman who broadcasts his wonders every single day to everyone around her. That's for the person who works in the hospital who broadcasts his wonders. God said, I have counted you worthy to speak on my behalf because the people in the world, guys, you don't get it. He gave his only son and came into the world and did signs and miracles and wonders and said, now you go do it. And the only criteria is that we say, yes, I believe in you. And he said, great, if you believe in me, I've empowered you and I've called you up to a greater level. And now see yourself the way I called you and go do the same signs, wonders, and miracles that there are. Go heal the sick. Go tell the lame to walk. Go open deaf ears. Go open blind eyes. How come you can go to other, you don't want to know what? I've been to other countries. Jess, you go to other countries. You've been to other countries. You want to know how quick people get a miracle? Pastor Chris did, has done tons of miracle crusades in India. You want to know how many people? I will never forget the, one of the, the first ones he did. And he's standing at the pulpit. And he's a young guy right out of Bible school. And he hears the Holy Spirit say, say this. There's a woman in the room who does not have the parts to have a baby. And he said, I am not going to say that. What? But he was obedient. And he said, there's a woman in this room today who does not have the parts to have a baby. And God said, you will conceive and have a child. I've met those children when I went to India. They walked right up to me. With, how many does she have, three or four? They have three kids, and she came up and said, oh, this is me. He said this in the meeting. Why does that happen in other countries? Why are we not concerned to fly to India and start opening blind eyes? Why don't we do it down at the street at Publix when we see someone who's blind? Because here we're worried about what people will say. They're going to diminish me. We go, oh, well, there's not enough. This is what I hear, and this really burns me up. Well, there's just not enough faith in, the, in America. There's not enough faith for that. You go to another country and everyone's so filled with faith. That is a bunch of baloney. You aren't filled with faith. As Pastor Chris said, you can break crutches, throw wheelchairs. Why don't you do what God, you cannot be who God called you to be though until you recognize and elevate the view of the value he's given you. No, I'm called to feel the sick. I'm called to lay hands on the sick. Oh, I see a little lady limping, walking across the street. I'm going to stop my car. Can I pray for you today, ma'am? You know, I went somewhere the other day, and it was really fun. It was an amazing, beautiful thing. My friend took me. It was so sweet and awesome. And you want to know what? The whole time, as this, this lady was giving me this beautiful facial, and it was so awesome, and I loved it, and it was nice. And the whole time, I felt compelled to, to preach the gospel to her. So I'm supposed to be sitting there relaxing and the Holy Spirit kept telling me to talk to her. So I just kept talking. And I'm sure she probably thought I was a nightmare because I'm one of those people, like, they don't want you to talk. They just want to like do your, and I'm sitting there telling her, let me tell you about the goodness of Jesus. Let me talk to you about my God. Oh, let me tell you, we pastor a church. Let me talk to you about this. And when we were done, I said, do you mind if I pray with you? Will you be okay if I pray with you right now? She said, will you please pray for me? My son is very ill and he needs a miracle. I said, we're going to pray right now. And then I gave her all the information about the church. And she said, thank God I got you today. What if I didn't say, what if I said, I'm not supposed to do that right now? No, see, what is she going to say? See, what we do is not just that. Here's the thing. I want to say this, and I hope I can articulate it correctly, is that sometimes it's not that the discount that other people put on us, but we discount ourselves and we go, but what are they going to think? They're going to discount me if I open my mouth and say what I'm supposed to say. Yeah. But what did he tell you to say? I walked out of that room. I think I was glowing. Was I glowing, Jeannie? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. It was not just the facial. I was so happy that I sat there for 50 minutes and I shared the love of Jesus with a woman who was obviously hurting and needed him. I didn't just relax because it was my relaxing moment. It was more fulfilling to me than it had I laid there for 50 minutes with the soft music almost falling asleep. I woke up energized. I woke up excited. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the opportunity to be your hands and feet today. We have to stop worrying that other people will discount our words and discount our actions. What if I lay hands on someone if it doesn't work? What if it does? And if it doesn't, 
say, keep the switch of faith turned on, and that gives you the opportunity to teach them about faith. You have to elevate your awareness of who you are. When you see yourself as less than, you won't do more and you won't be more. The second thing you have to elevate is your articulation. <laughs> I had to find a fancy word to say the way you talk. Elevate the way you talk, guys. We have to start elevating the way that we talk. What are you saying about yourself? I'm not talking now about what other people are saying about you. I'm talking about what are you saying for yourself? What do you say when you look in the mirror? I don't like you. Do you look in the mirror and say, you're ugly, I don't like you. Do you look in the mirror and say, I don't like this part of me. Do you look in the mirror and say, I just wish I could be more like that person. I wish I could be more. Do you look in the mirror and say, I'm a failure? Do you look in the mirror and say, I don't know what more to do. Do you look in the mirror and say, I'm depressed? What are you saying? What words are coming out of your mouth, guys? It's time to elevate the things that you're saying. I, I'm going to read you that in, in 1 Samuel again because I think it's so good and there's no other verse I can think of that articulates it better. When David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you defied, and today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head and I'll give your dead bodies to the men. And everyone here is going to know that the Lord rescues his people because this is the Lord battle and he gives it to us. The power of your words is so important. Pastor Chris has a whole series. I'm not just talking about confession. I'm not talking about confessing the word. I'm talking about looking in the mirror and not just saying it, but believing. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You formed me in my mother's womb. You knit me together. And man, I'm going to praise you because your works are so great. You've anointed me and you've appointed me. And you want to know what, God? I mess up every single day. But you want to know what? Your mercies are new every morning towards me, and you never have a crossword to say. And you want to know what, Jesus? You would sell everything you had just to win me back. And for that, I'm eternally grateful, and I'm worth everything in this world. That's the best thing you need. You want to start looking young, start reading the word, and start telling yourself who you are. You'll get a glow that a facial can't give you. Amen. You'll get a glow that nothing, you want to know why? It comes from the word of God. There was this Japanese scientist, his name was Dr. Masaru Emoto, and he wrote this book called The Hidden Messages of Water. I have not read the book, so please don't read it and find crazy things in it and blame me. I'm just going to tell you about one thing I found. Seriously, I did not read the whole book. I just read an excerpt of it because I thought this was so fascinating. He conducted these experiments. He had this theory about water. And he froze water, and, and he photographed it, and he took pictures of the water. And basically what he would do, he froze these samples and it said this, and he, he was convinced that if you keep water, anything that's in a loving and, and kind and nurturing atmosphere will grow and anything that's in a negative environment will become stagnant and die. So he took these pictures of these crystals, he froze the crystals of ice and he put some of them and exposed them to loving words and positive words. And it said that the crystals that formed in that block of ice were beautiful and colorful and looked like snowflakes. But on the contrary, when the water was exposed to negative words and the thought was crystallized, it was incomplete, dull, and asymmetrical patterns were observed. Please tell me that your words are not important. Your words about yourself are more important. You need to get in the mirror every day and say, I'm the most beautiful person. I told Courtney the other day, I cannot tell on you, Courtney. Last night I said, Courtney's the best drummer in the whole world. He said, oh, no, I'm not. I said, you better keep your coat on, Courtney. You're the best drummer in the whole world because I said you were. So I want you to start saying I'm the best drummer in the whole world. We think it, the world has conditioned us to think that if we say positive things about ourselves, that we're arrogant and we're conceited, but we're not. We're just echoing back what the word of God says. If you're not comfortable, open up the Bible and find a verse that says you're beautiful and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am beautiful because he made me beautiful. I am kind. I'm wonderful. I am loving. I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm called according to his purpose I'm anointed there's never been anyone more anointed than me right. pastor Chris said one time he told someone he was Jesus in the earth and they were like what who do you think you are I think I'm Jesus in the earth and so are you look in the mirror and say I'm the why does it say be his hands be his feet do what he does Jesus is not in the earth Jesus is in the spirit realm it's our job to be him in there. There's nothing wrong with looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, I am called, I am anointed, I am appointed. I don't care what anyone else says about me. I love me. 
But you want to know what? People go, oh, that's arrogant. That's conceited. Oh, you love you? Oh, yeah. No, I do. You want to know what? I love me for the, probably that's more right. than I ever loved myself in the history of my life. I love myself. Amen. You want to know why? Because I was a mess. I lived life for a long time. I walked away from God for seven years and lived my life how I wanted. Then Jesus lovingly brought me back to himself because the goodness of God brings a man or a woman to repentance. And one day driving down a road all by myself, my heart ached for my relationship with Jesus because he'd been whispering and calling to me. And I said this in the road. There was no one on the road. It was Thanksgiving night. And I said, God, and after seven years of walking away from him and doing what I wanted to do in my own life and I did some pretty I was messed up but anyone else messed up in this place come on am I the only one that was messed up thank you like I said I have some people that know me now that go you used to be a preacher or you're a preacher now and I have some people that can't believe I never was anything but one because I'm a new creature in Christ but you want to know what the older I get I, I like how Lisa Harper says it I'm like she said she says she's 60 if you don't know who Lisa Harper is as PC's like, he has a preacher crush on her. I don't care because I do too. She's amazing. Go watch her. She's awesome. And she says, I'm 60. Well, I'm really 58, but I'm going to be 60 in two years. So I'm just going to keep saying it. So I think I'm going to be 50 in two years. So I'm going to keep saying it. The older I get, the more I love myself. Because I lived a long part of my life where I didn't love anything about myself. And I spoke negative things to myself. And I allowed myself and I allowed people in my life that I should never have allowed in my life because I did not value who I was. See, guys, you have to have people in your life that value you. You have to get your words going. You have to say, you want to know what? It says this. You've got to find scriptures that talk about how valuable you are. And for time's sake, I'm going to tell you that you've got to elevate your actions. Elevate your actions. So we're going to elevate our awareness, elevate our articulation, elevate your actions, which is your behavior. You have to, as Pastor Chris says, live up to your label. Don't you like how I just, I give him credit for his own material? It's so good. How are you acting? Are you acting like you have value or are you acting like you're beneath and less than? You want to know what? People go, oh, I'm just humble. I'm just going to be humble. You know what? Acting like you're less than anybody else is not humility because humility just means that you're lining up with what the word of God says and you're agreeing with it. And when you say you're less than, you're not being humble. You're being disobedient to the word of God. You're being pride. That's what pride is. Humility just means I agree with God's word. And let me let you in on a secret. You can't agree with part of God's word and discount the rest of it. You can't agree. Uh, there's a thing they call two gospel syndrome where I believe what God says for you, but I just don't believe it's true for me. You got to let that go and say, if this is the word of God, well, I don't have my Bible with me, but I have my iPad with my Bible on it. And you want to know what? If this Bible says it, I believe it. Oh, I don't feel good about myself. Oh, I see this. What is your saying? It says in Ephesians chapter four, verse one through three, as a prisoner of the Lord, Paul's talking here, I plead with you. He doesn't say, please do this. He doesn't say, can you maybe just think about it? He said, I'm pleading with you. He was in prison. And all he could do was write letters to these people. He said, I'm pleading with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank. We, we read the walk holy part, but have you stopped to read in a way that's suitable to the rank that God has given you? Given to you in your divine calling with tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another and dare I say toward yourself, especially toward those who may try your patience. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace. He tells you, be humble, be patient, be humble is the first one. Be humble. And remember what I said, being humble means I agree with whatever God's word says. That's the first part of it. I agree with it. it says, he said, I'm a king, so I'm a king. He said, I will am above and not beneath. He said, I'm the head and not the tail. It looks like I'm the tail right now, but get out of my way because I'm supposed to be the head. He said, I am blessed and highly favored. He said, I am rich and not poor. He said, I am weak and not strong. I'm strong and not weak. Don't say that. <laughs> You have to elevate your actions. And the last one I'm going to give you tonight is this. You have to elevate your associations. See, there was a long time that I didn't even, I didn't know who Roberta Cavalli was. If I'd have walked into that store probably a long time, a while back, I wouldn't have bought those jeans because I don't think they were that cool. I thought they were kind of ugly myself. I only bought them so I could sell them on Poshmark, I told you. But I didn't know who Roberta Cavalli was. I wouldn't have recognized the value. 
But then I got around some people who began to challenge my vision, who began to show me something a little greater and a place greater than I was myself. I got around some people who began to show me a few things. And, and the thing is this, once you elevate your associations, you can't go back to where you were. Because the things that you used to think were good, you look at and go, mm, that's not good anymore because I got this now. I'm not talking about being bougie and buying designer clothes. I didn't know who they were, though, until I associated myself with someone who showed me what that was. And when they opened my eyes to what that was, I was able to recognize value in something that other people devalued. Some of you need to change your associations and get around people who can take you from where you are to where you want to go. These people made me think bigger and dream bigger and recognize things that were bigger than me and showing me things. I walked into a room once and I was like, I don't think I actually belong here. Has anyone else ever had that happen? Yes. Yes. You're looking around and you're thinking, I don't know, but God puts you in places for a reason and he elevates you for a reason. It's time for you to take your position in the place he elevates you. And I'm not talking about things in the natural. I'm talking about things in the spirit. There are people that you get around that open your eyes to a life greater than you could have ever dreamed or imagined on your own. Why are you living among the pigs in the slop when you can go live in the palace? I am not calling your friends pigs. Please do not get offended. What I'm saying is this. The prodigal son lived a life in a palace and went and associated with the wrong people and they dragged him down to live in a pig pen, eating scraps that the pigs were eating. And then one day he said, the servant in my father's house has far more than this. I'm just going to go be a servant because my daddy's house was a better place to be because he knew he'd already, if he had not had a taste of the good life, he would have been fine living in the slop. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I hope tonight you're elevated in your mind enough to go the things I've been thinking, the things I've been feeling, the way I've been acting, the way I've been speaking, the way I've been talking, the way I've been walking is beneath who God made me to be. You have to elevate your associations. Pastor Chris told me a story about his friend. His friend was a, as a minister, and he was kind of he went to this this place, and it was this meeting where all these big big name pastors that you would know if you heard them. And the, he said they were all in the room talking, and it was like he couldn't even understand what they were talking about. He said it was like we were all staying in the same hotel on the same floor, and they were looking out seeing a penthouse, and I was seeing the fourth floor basement. They all saw something he didn't see, but I have to tell you, if you start getting, sometimes it's intimidating to get around people who stretch you. Because it's easier to be a little fish in a big, a big fish in a small pond sometimes than to take a leap and go, hey, I want to learn and grow. You can get comfortable staying where you're at, but you have to listen to someone who can elevate you, who can change your thinking, who can say, let me open your eyes that there's something greater and there's something more. There's nothing wrong with McDonald's, but once you go to Hyde Park, you're not going to go to McDonald's anymore. <laughs> Pastor Chris, is that right? No. The thing is this, you have to see, you have to get around people who see greatness in you. You have to get around people who you go, no, I'm messed up, and they go, no, you're a champion. You have to get around people who you say, ah, I'm struggling. And they say, you can do all things through Christ who strengthen you. You're more than a conqueror. You have to get around someone who can elevate your thought process and elevate your vision. Who you associate with is so important. Listen, at, Pastor Chris said it great last night. He said, if you're hanging around with ding-dongs, get rid of them. I'm not going to tell you to kick people out of your life. I'm going to tell you to not let people speak into your life. Amen. Love them from afar. That's right. That's right. Pray for them. Minister to them. But listen, if you constantly have our only, our, our pastor said it the best. He said, you spend 90% of your time with people who need you. And you only spend 10% of your time with people you need. And that is backwards. You need to spend 90% of the time with people you need and 10% of the time with people who need you. And you say, that's selfish. Everybody needs me. But if everyone's always pulling off pieces of you and nobody's filling you back up, then pretty soon you're nothing and left with nothing. You're depleted. Pastors, listen to me. Preachers, people pull you and pull you and pull you and you think, I got to minister to them. I got to help them all. No, you do not. I tell people sometimes, I give them, I tell them, I've had, I, I tell my staff sometimes, I'm like, give them a track to run on. If they don't run on the track, tell them goodbye because they are wasting your time. How can you say people are a waste of your time? I just did. Because somebody who is not taking you to the next level and is draining you and bringing you down to their level, I want to be around people who are, want to come up to the level that I'm trying to bring them to. Yes. Yes. 
Try it a couple times. I'm not just talking to the preachers. I'm talking to everyone in the room. You're trying to, oh, I be, I, this person's been sucking the life out of me for five years, but I just feel like if I just give them one more lunch, if I just go to coffee with them one more time, maybe they're going to finally listen. They're not going to listen. Let me set you free. They're not going to listen. Take that hour and go spend time with someone who fills you up. If you're going to mentor somebody, mentor someone who wants to hear. They don't just want to talk to you about where they're at. They said, where are you at? And I want to get there and help me. What's your association? Who are you hanging out with? You have to elevate your association. You got to get around people who see the greatness in you and take you to another level. Tonight, maybe you're in here. Maybe you've devalued yourself. Maybe you say, you can move that rack out of the way if you need to. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm way more valuable than I've allowed people to place the label on me too. Well, guess what? Actually, can I have that rack back for one second? Because I want to show you how easy it is right now. Let me show you how easy it is right now. I'm going to show you how easy. Are you ready? Now, these could be hanging in a posh boutique, probably selling for about three, dollars $400 right now. Why? Because the $15 label is gone. And the only label that's left on is the one that the original designer put on it. And maybe you came in, you can take it now, Evan. Maybe you came in here tonight and maybe you said, I have labeled, other people have labeled me. My friends have labeled me. My family has labeled me. People have diminished my value. And I've started to believe that I'm not valuable. I've started to believe that I'm not worthy. Maybe you're like the woman who came into Jesus, who although everyone said, you're a sinner, you're a prostitute, you don't belong here, you're not worthy. She said, I just wanna worship you, Jesus. And she pushed through the crowd of insecurity and pushed through the doubts. And she said, I'm gonna worship him. Maybe you're like David, who has a warrior on the inside of you, but people have tried to discount you. People have tried to say, you're not. You're not good enough, you're not big enough, you're not brave enough, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not talented enough, you don't speak well enough, you don't write well enough. Maybe you're in this place tonight. And you just felt that as time went on, you kind of depreciated your value a little bit. You didn't mean to. But you just looked up and the person who you used to think you were seemed so, so far away. All over this place, can you just, come on, just stand up on your feet for a minute. You can stand up on your feet. We're gonna just worship God for a minute. Maybe you just need to be reminded of how God sees you. Just lift your hands to heaven and begin to worship.